So thank you, Daphne, for inviting me. Um, and um, I'm not sure that I was aware that this was the inaugural um, um, session for Migration Matters, or that I'd be really the first speaker. So, <laughs> so that's a big task. And I'm not sure if my talk today will really live up to that. But anyhow, I will do my best. Um, so thank you again for the invitation. Um, my talk is about, um, this is titled Sex Trafficking or Migrant Sexual Labor. Um, and I want to kind of think about the different discourses that we have available to us and thinking about uh, migrant, um, sec migrant women in the sex trade. They're often thought about and classified as trafficked victims who are believed to be lured and captured and taken across national or state borders and held against their will in prostitution. But my work for over a couple of decades, um, as well as others, has kind of suggested that this approach is, um, does not really capture the complexity of the situation and is only really one way of viewing the issue. So in this talk, I am dealing with two different approaches. Um, for thinking about migrant involvement in the sex trade. And for some of you who have taken courses with me or know my work, this is not new. And those of you who are, who are doing stuff on trafficking, it may, may not be new either. Um, but my argument is that discourses of sex trafficking and sex trafficked victims are more harmful than useful for migrant women. Um, and work to displace the issues of border control, nationalism, and globalization, while obscuring mig migrant subjectivity and sex worker agency, and denying women the rights to mobility, health care, and social services, security, and respect. Um, another way of understanding and analyzing migrants in the sex trade is therefore necessary. And before I jump into um, doing the rest of the paper, I just um, would like to um, welcome Eleni, who is here um, in, just moved to Canada, to Toronto, from Hong Kong, where she was working for many years with a migrant, se with a sex workers organization, and is going to be, is, is organizing in Toronto, or through Toronto, a new Asian migrant sex worker organization. And so, um, in part, this, I think, ties in with some of her work, and she may be able to participate in some of the discussion as well. So welcome, Eleni. Um, but first of all, um, the idea of sex trafficking. When I first started researching um, the sex trade in the 1990s, the concept of sex trafficking didn't even exist. Rather, it came into being around the time that the UN and the US began to formulate their new policies and the Palermo Protocol on Human Trafficking and the US Trafficking in Persons Act, which later changed name. Um, it was introduced, this term sex trafficking, by a group of feminists that have become to be known um, as abolitionist feminists, such as Janice Raymond and the US-based Coalition Against Trafficking in Women, the CATW. This particular feminist approach sees all prostitution or sex work as constituting female sexual slavery and builds upon a much older feminist tradition around the subject, dating back to the campaigns by Josephine Butler out of England in the 19th century and later carried forward in the work by feminist scholars such as Kathleen Barry, Sheila Jeffries, Melissa Farley, Donna Hughes and Dorkin Leidholt. In this perspective, prostitution is a male-created patriarchal institution for the terrorization, control, and exploitation of women, sim similar to that of marriage, the family, and the veil. And this is particularly relevant, relevant or evident, I should say, in the work of Kathleen Barry and Sheila Jeffries in, in their books that they've written. Um, and in this perspective, women in the sex trade are viewed as inherently forced, i.e. prostituted, which is the term that is used in this perspective, 
um, or trafficked. The abolitionist feminist discourse is directly tied to what is known in feminist circles as radical feminism that emerged out of the North American and Western European women's movement in the 1960s. And while many ideas of radical feminism have been contested, um, particularly by black third world and post-colonial feminists who have critiqued the Eurocentrism um, and Euro-American centrism in the theorizing, conceptualization, and politics um, of feminism, and many of the ideas have been rethought and reformulated, um, still an unreconstructed, unexamined definition of prostitution has been maintained throughout. Prostitution is unconditionally and without exception defined as sexual violence against women. Sex working women and girls in this perspective become automatically victims who are rescued and saved by those whom you know best. And it's been pointed out, and, and several of us have written about the kind of maternalistic, if you like, and at times colonial connotations that this carries with it. Moreover, the sex trafficking discourse has a strong anti-migration, has strong anti-migration foundations that are grounded in Western European and North American concerns about cross-border migrations by women. This also started in the 19th century, with the mobility and trade of women's labor and bodies being linked to the emergence of migrant women in prostitution and coupled to notions of loose sexual relations, degraded feminine sexuality, and the immorality of migrant men. A number of scholars, including Joe Duesma, Ron Weitzer, and Elizabeth Bernstein at um, Columbia University, have written about this um, um, older um, trend as producing a racialized social panic about the white slave trade that was concerned primarily with what is believed to be the entrapment and enslavement of predominantly white Western and North American women in prostitution. The, white, the panic about the white slave trade led to campaigns, laws, and international conventions to abolish the morally defined so-called social evil of prostitution through control of women's movements and, in effect, exercise control over their sexuality. The contemporary idea of sex, of sex trafficking builds upon the anti-migration, anti-prostitution legacies and is fully established in the US Trafficking and Victims Protection Act. As Melissa Dittmore observes in her article reflecting upon what took place during the negotiations around um, the UN Protocol on Human Trafficking in 2000, the US feminist abolitionists fought hard to insert their anti-prostitution framework into the international arena. And although they were not successful at the UN level, not completely, they did succeed at the US national level, due in part, I mean, or, or well, probably wholly, to the conservative political climate under the Bush administration at the time, backed up by a large media monopoly, and as Bernstein and Troy Fitzpatrick carefully document, through an unusual but powerful alliance with the Christian right. Whites and Dittmore go on to note that feminist abolitionism helped to transform the campaign against sex trafficking into an official government campaign against prostitution. So there was a sort of collapse in there between trafficking and prostitution. The criminalization of prostitution in the US legal context is enforced through its annual anti-trafficking tip report system, as well on which all countries have to report to the US about what they're doing on trafficking in their countries according to the US standards and ideas. Um, and um, it's also connected to international aid and development policies where organizations are required to sign an anti-prostitution pledge, an oath that they do not support prostitution as employment options or the legalization of prostitution in order to receive funding. And this was a big issue for Brazil a number of years ago, where um, Brazil re refused um, 40 million US dollars because the organizations are working with um, sex workers would not sign this anti-prostitution pledge. <clears throat> 
In Europe and Canada, a trend towards the equation of trafficking with prostitution in government laws and policies and interventions is also discernible, especially under neoliberal conditions accompanied by nationalist and racist fears of being swamped by migrants seeking refuge, economic opportunities and securities, despite the gains being made and that have been made in gender and sexual equality. But why reject the idea of tra sex trafficking, you may ask? Aren't most women in the, and girls held against their will in the sex trade? Aren't innocent women lured across borders and forced into prostitution? Now, I do not want to suggest there are no harms, violations of rights, or injustices that migrants face in the sex trade, or that migrant women and girls are not vulnerable to racism or gender and sexual violence. However, as I've written elsewhere, rather than getting to the bottom of things, as Emma Goldman once said we need to do in her critical essay on the traffic of women written some hundred years ago, the contemporary sex trafficking discourse today result in a number of negative social impacts. These include, and they're just really a list of things, stronger anti-prostitution ideologies, infantilizing rescue missions, um, to save women and girls deemed to be innocent victims, and now we have a lot of Hollywood particip participation in that. Greater police surveillance of the sex trade, in other words, more raids on sex clubs and red light districts by the police. New legislation that can replic um, replicate laws already on the books, thus expanding an already large state legal appara apparatus. Programs to catch traffickers and by that, we should be read, understanding mostly immigrant and migrant men. New legislation to apprehend and shame clients of prostitutes, such as the Swedish or Nordic model for prostitution, and very recently in the Netherlands, where some clients are being threatened with jail. And as Anderson Sharma and Wright note, more border controls to prevent aliens from entering wealthy areas of the world, coupled to a greater number of detentions and deportations of so-called illegal migrants. It has also created a generalized panic about the idea of human trafficking that is causing anxiety, especially amongst young women, to travel aboard um, or migrate. And this was very interesting in a class that I teach a course on um, human trafficking. And last year in the course, um, two of my students um, was telling me how scared they actually were to travel, to, they, they, they're going to Italy, and um, the idea of human trafficking had scared them so much that they wouldn't go out at night in, when they were in Italy because they were scared that they would be captured or taken by somebody. And that was something very real that they lived. I mean, it's not that they knew of anybody who'd been trafficked or anything like that. It was more a question of just this media play and uh, discourse on, on sex trafficking and human trafficking that scared them. Um, all these dimensions have been documented and analyzed quite extensively as the so-called collater collateral damage of the anti-trafficking industry and are increasingly seen to be harmful to sex workers and migrants and migrant sex workers. Such critique critique of the sex trafficking discourse comes from a different perspective on the sex trade that takes into account structural forces and constraints, a notion of sexuality as a human source of energy that is inserted into productive, reproductive, as well as affective relations and can be analyzed as sexual labor, as well as the rights, agencies, and subjectiv subjectivity of migrant sex workers. It draws from the feminist shift away from the sexual slavery um, perspective and is grounded in grassroots activities and action research projects with trafficked women, particularly in and from the global south, and started in the 1990s. Elaborated through, certain, uh, through collaborations between certain so-called third world feminists and sex worker rights activists, such as Marin Wires and Lynn Lapp, myself and Joe Duzma, Jyoti Sanghera and Annalie Lepp, it offered nuanced and different analyses to those advocated and um, articulated by the second wave radical feminists. And indicated that although many women were indeed coerced and violated in the global sex trade, their situations could be seen and read in many ways as similar to those of other migrant women 
who seek to make a livelihood for themselves and their families in a world shaped by unequal relations of power around various axes. And I have referred to this perspective elsewhere as a transnational feminist perspective on the sex trade um, that sees it com complexly shaped by hegemonic and local patriarchies, globalized capitalism, and the widening gaps in income and wealth, as well as by reconfigurations of empire under late 20th century globalization or 21st century globalization that reinscribe international and national hierarchies around racial, religious, and national difference. From such a perspective, the global sex trade is defined as one, but not the only site in which human trafficking can be located. Sectors that require unskilled or semi-skilled non-sexual labor, such as domestic service and manufacturing, are some of the other sites. Sex work for migrant women then becomes a better option sometimes, especially for those without papers and documents to stay and work in a foreign country. This re reconceptualization of migrant women in the sex trade rests upon the understanding of the imbrication of force and violence in conditions and processes in which poor, predominantly brown and black women are involved in their search for social and economic security on a global scale, having to, to rely sometimes on ruthless people, smugglers, corrupt officials and police at home and abroad, unscrupulous business persons and managers who run sex clubs, brothels and the wider sex industry, or greedy middlemen and brokers who arrange jobs, travel and entry to a new country. It views migrant women and sex workers as agents in their own right, with com complex identities and subjectivities, who have to, gate, who have to navigate treacherous or precarious terrain, and recognizes that while they may be victimized, few will identify themselves as traffic um, victims or victims of trafficking. Instead, it has been found and documented in various research projects that prostitution is often quite um, often defined and accepted as work, the sale of sexual labor, and a more lucrative option than other types of work especially if an un, in an undocumented status and one's options are cleaning other people's homes or working long shifts under close supervision for a very meager wage. The idea of sex trafficking is believed to curb, um, from this perspective, to curb women's rights to um, self-determination, including sexual self-determination, and to ignore the fact that the um, sex work is a livelihood strategy in a world structured by a gendered, racialized, international division of labor. And for some women and some men, it may be a preferable, preferable way to make a living as an undocumented or new migrant. Much of the violence and problems they encounter in the sex trade is in large part due to the underground circuits that they are forced into, due to closed borders, and the criminalization of prostitution in most countries. Now, many um, anti-sex trafficking initiatives have led to a deportation of women migrants. Few migrants who are saved from sex work through police raids, religious or feminist outreach projects, or other campaigns, are given residency or protection in the place that they are rescued. This is including in Canada. But instead, are deported back home, defined as illegal immigrants. They may also be publicly viewed as shameless loose women or whores who sully and destroy the purity of the nation state. However, it's also been found that migrant sex workers, as with other migrant workers, may view their situations in a new country as just a result of some bad luck or as a bad decision and do not necessarily want to be saved, but rather to stay where they are and to go on with their lives in the hope of securing a better job or way of life down the road. The measures of rescue, rehabilitation, or deport deportation also do not address the underlying causes and overlook the fact that many women, many and men, often have little to return to. The economic, political, or social conditions at home from where they left may not have improved or may have worsened. Some women re um, returnees or deportees are faced with long, um, lifelong 
stigmatization and ostracization due to their involvement in prostitution abroad, suspended indefinitely in homes and institutions because of specific patriarchal notions of purity and defilement of womanhood. And there's some very good studies being done on Nepal as to what happens when women are rescued and saved and sent from India and sent back to Nepal um, precisely on this issue. And some attempt to leave home again in search of a better life. Retrafficking, as it's sometimes called, is being documented around the world as well as a pop-up, push-down effect, where the problem is suppressed in one place amongst one population, yet resurfaces in another location involving other populations or communities. The conditions that underpin migrations or a search for a life free of hunger and violence, sexual, political, gender, or state, are barely the focus of change in the sex trafficking um, campaigns. So in short, I want to suggest, and I'm finishing here, that we listen and learn carefully from migrant women's experiences in the sex trade prior to, prior to rushing in to save them. For many, it is a job that they are willing to take up, and for many, rescue may be antithetical to their own desires, dreams, and hopes. Respect for sex work itself while also working to change the wider conditions that produce undocumented migrants are keys to approaching migrant sex work. Thank you.